Suicide Grief Essentials. My name is Alan Peterson, and I'm the Executive Director of the Compassionate Friends, and we are just honored tonight uh, to bring you this uh, webinar. It's going to be very informative and very helpful to a lot of you. And we bring this to you tonight in partnership with our dear friends at Open to Hope. They are uh, just the, probably the world's largest resource of grief information and articles and television and radio programs. They're dear friends of mine and I would like to uh, welcome them right now, Dr. Gloria Horsley and Dr. Heidi Horsley uh, from Open to Hope. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies. How are you doing? Hi, it's Gloria. Great, Alan. It's great being on the show today. See, how are Hi. you doing? I just are thought you, I'd uh, say hello. I want to introduce our guest tonight. Gloria, you're going to uh, talk to him uh, first off here, but Franklin Cook, he's a dear friend of all of ours. He has uh, not only experienced a suicide loss in his life that he's going to talk about, but he is really one of the, we call him a rock star, but one of the top people uh, that we deal with out there um, who really does bridge the professional world with the people who have experienced the loss. He understands it very well. So uh, welcome to uh, the webinar tonight, Franklin Cook, my good friend. How are you this evening? I'm just great, Alan, and thanks so much for having me. It's a great uh, pleasure and an honor to join you and Heidi and Gloria tonight. Okay, Franklin, yeah, there's a little town in Utah called Brigham City. Oh, here your parents are. The left-hand picture is of my uh, dad and his parents. Probably wouldn't be too long after we moved to uh, Brigham City. Mm -hmm. You have the right-hand picture is my dad and me and my oldest son, who's now in his early 40s. The picture in the lower right is my mom and dad at the 25th wedding anniversary, 1977. And the other uh, group picture is just actually about probably six weeks or so before my dad died in 1978. Wow, so it looks like the perfect family scene. And uh, Absolutely. Your dad was with Thiokol. He was an engineer. Is that right? Yes, he was. Yeah, he worked for Thiokol Chemical Corporation. He was not an engineer, however. He worked for the Air Force on uh, verifying uh, the Air Force contracts. So he was a civilian employee of the U.S. Air Force. My dad uh, that summer had uh, begun to suffer from a serious major depressive episode, and over the course of four months, he became more and more ill and more and more depressed and he was finally admitted to a psychiatric hospital and even though he was there on suicide watch he managed to acquire um, an instrument with which to wound himself and he killed himself as an inpatient in the psychiatric hospital in, in northern Utah. Well I think uh, first of all one of the things that comes with suicide is the feeling of shock especially upon learning the news or, or being exposed to the suicide itself, but it's a sudden death. Uh, it is almost always unexpected. Uh, it is very, very much uh, a violent death in most instances. And overall, suicide is something that we're unfamiliar with, that people are unfamiliar with. You see it's unnatural or unacceptable, and it certainly can be overwhelming, just like a uh, natural disaster. It's only... Uh, you know, one fatality instead of mass casualties, but it still has that that texture or that punch of a of a nat natural disaster. I was just wondering, did did um did you have any idea that that uh he felt like he was so depressed that he wanted to take his life? It sounds like he yeah, did. absolutely. It's a great it's a great question. We knew that he was uh, very much at risk for suicide. In fact, that's why he was hot but it still came as an enormous shock to us, and I hear other uh, people say this as well, that even though they knew their loved one was, let's say, at risk or in danger, it still uh, came as a shock to them that the, that the person would actually destroy himself or herself. But that act is so um, unimaginable that, that uh, even though it seems like it might happen. When it actually does happen, it still comes as a shock. And of course, many people, it, it, it comes as an absolute surprise um, that this happens. And as you can see here, at the end of the day, you can do everything in the world to try to protect your loved one, but things can still happen. I mean, he was, he was hospitalized and he still, unfortunately, managed to die by suicide. Absolutely. Suicide, uh, we know, can be uh, preventable, but I think it's also important for people who are left behind to remember that uh, sometimes 
in spite of our best efforts, and in spite of the best efforts of caregivers, people still do die by suicide, and that's a very sad and tragic fact. So let me talk about disbelief a little bit, because this is another feature that it's not unique to suicide, but it has a peculiar flavor with suicide, in that I would say that one of the most common reactions to suicide is that a that nobody can believe that this happened or that this person um, actually uh, killed himself or herself. And the idea about reality being negated isn't that we live in another reality, but it's like we did not really, we get the feeling that we did not really know the person or that we did not really um, understand the relationship we had to the person as well as we, we thought. We thought we knew them or we thought our relationship meant a certain thing. Um, and then finally, it's very common for people to, to deny suicide as the cause of death, regardless of the overwhelming evidence that it is a suicide. So this disbelief pretty much comes with the territory for many people. Part, we are numb, let's say, and so I think it might also have something to do w with that, that we, that we can't get our bearings again, and we can't fit this into the world as we know it, it's that this awful thing happened to our loved one. Uh, at the Compassionate Friends, I, I see a lot of people, and I, I'm sure Alan does and Heidi, who come in and they are not sure. I mean, people are saying, well, you know, I, I found him uh, hanging from a tree, but I'm not sure how it happened. I mean, it really is hard for people to come to terms with the, the idea of suicide. And uh, I think it's hard for people to support them when they yeah. really can't come to terms with that. Yeah, I think I think it is. Uh, first of all, I just uh, would say that the it is very difficult, I think, for a medical examiner or a coroner to write suicide on the death certificate because of the the stigma around it and so forth. So even though certainly uh, officials make mistakes. I think the first thing is to learn what the actual judgment of the of the experts are about the cause of death. And again, that doesn't mean that they're always right, but it certainly is a good indicator and something that, you know, people should take seriously, just the quote, facts of the matter. But beyond that, I think that people need to search this out for themselves and people need to be given the latitude to tell their story of what they think happened or why they have doubts and not have anybody convince them one way or the other or, or anything like that so that people really do have the leeway to work their way through the story as they see it and to find answers themselves and with others' help about what happened um, to their loved one. I think that one of the things that um, happens is people are trying to protect other family members, which I think can be really problematic because then they can't, you know, you, you can't talk about it. It, it, it becomes so shame-based. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true that uh, really sometimes it's about protecting family members or, or hiding it from family members outside the first circle of family. Sometimes it's about uh, not wanting uh, friends and neighbors to know that this was the cause of death. Sometimes it's about not wanting children to know, and those kinds of things. And generally speaking, um, uh, the truth of the matter is always going to come out um, sometime or other. And in any way that a person can find themselves, uh, uh, if a person finds himself or herself in that ambiguous or ambivalent uh, circumstance where they're not sure what to say, I hope you get the encouragement uh, to go ahead and, and find your own way to tell the story that it, that it was a suicide, because I think generally and, and, in the long run that's helpful. And Franklin, how old were you when your dad died by suicide? I was 24 years old and he was 49 years old when, when and, he died. And it looks like you guys had a lot of siblings, right? Or a lot of, there were a lot uh, of people three, in that Three part. brothers, yeah. They're, the the picture showed my three brothers and their families at the time. So, so there were a lot uh, of... Um, grandchildren and were all was everyone in your family told that your dad died by suicide yeah that's a, that's a great question because the answer is no okay. <laughs> you know but the the we weren't uh, we didn't hide that story like let's say among ourselves or with uh, 
you know, with the grown-ups uh, in the family, everybody knew that, that it was suicide. But different of us dealt with our children differently. And some of the children learned over time. Some of the children learned from their cousins who had already known. So again, that's kind of our, our story includes, I think, some things that if we were to do it over again, we might do differently. One of my brother's families didn't learn until many years later uh, that their grandfather died by suicide. And again, I'm not making a judgment about, right. about that. If people don't tell people, you run into the, you know, the concern that your kids are going to find out from somebody else and they might find out misinformation. So, Absolutely. So, you know, you're, you're kind of giving up all control. If you don't tell them you can be giving up the control of how they're going to find out. Uh, this person wants to say, how do you communicate as a parent knowing your child took his life, although it was through the means of drugs? Our son was hospitalized for suicide attempt three times. He self-medicated through drugs. He knew he wouldn't be here for long. Um, at 17, he succeeded, however, because uh, drugs were used. It was questioned. I struggle to use the word suicide, but I know, and this person puts it in capital, I know that it is what it was. I haven't even been able to speak to my family about it. So here is a person who feels like she, her son did prepare her, that he was going to overdose, and he did it, and, and she can't, she knows it. What do I do about it? I can't even speak to my family. I'm sitting here with that. You got any thoughts, for Boy, I just, first of all, really sympathize uh, with the person. And th there are circumstances like this. We actually call it um, ambiguous grief, where um, the person may not know precisely the cause of death, but it was suicide in the same way it's suicide if a person, uh, you know, uh, jumps off a building or something like that. But drug overdose today has become more and more prevalent and there's this huge gray area. So I think that the that whatever the doubts are about the cause of death, this is still a very stigmatized kind of death. It is uh, very sudden and it has all of those features of, of, uh, of, of uh, a suicide death. And so I think that, again, just uh, all the things that we say about taking care of yourself around a suicide death apply and that maybe there are answers you're not going to know you know uh, maybe not ever know the you know the real story behind the person's death that's a possibility but I think uh, this person has a right to her own opinion that it is suicide oh absolutely and, oh absolutely yeah, and, yeah I think right. matter of fact matter of fact let me let me uh, say something to be to be clear I think that we all have a right to our own story about what happened and it's not so much about whether our story is factually correct or whether our story can be substantiated or whether different people have different stories but we need to each of us make sense of this uh, awful kind of uh, death in our own way and I think that that's a process and that if a person believes uh, that their loved one died by suicide, as this person apparently does, then absolutely, that's your story. And I think that it's important for you to feel um, affirmed in, in that, 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 nope, that's what happened to your loved one. And it also empowers you to go get the kind of help you need for, for what has happened so that you can go to the next step and go get uh, help that you need having uh, lost a loved one to suicide. Well, well, and you can also end up doing what you did, Franklin, which is to be an advocate and build awareness and say, hey, you're not alone. Others have been there. And, and when you speak out, you can helping people get help and helping people cope after suicide loss, and you can really make a huge difference and do it in honor of your dad. Yeah, absolutely. I think that I think that one route, whether your whether your loved one dies of of, uh, of cancer or of mm -hmm. suicide or, of, or of a drug um, overdose, a drug overdose or motor vehicle accident. Certainly, the world is made up of advocates and prevention um, workers who come from having had an experience with the kind of death that they're. Uh, you know that they that they were exposed to, so that they go out and really do change the world. You look at examples like Mothers Against Drunk Driving, and there are many, many, many examples 
Uh, and especially in the suicide world, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of us who, who go out and advocate and work in prevention and all that sort of thing. I think that, um, boy, stigma and shame is really the, the real bugaboo around, around suicide. So historically, uh, suicide has been a death that has been judged negatively by society. And so that history is still alive and well in, in uh, modern times. And so when a person dies by suicide, his or her character or, or value or morality is, can be called into question. And the judgments that fall upon the deceased also make the jump to uh, survivors. So a woman who loses her husband, people will say, well, something must have been wrong with that marriage. Or parents who lose a child will say, people will say, you know, what, what must they have done, done or, or not done? Uh, and so there's a lot of judgmentalism, a lot of uh, blame and shame, or, or can be, uh, not always, but can be around suicide. That's certainly true. This is Alan. I, I want to talk a little bit because I know we're, we're talking about shame and, and guilt and, and regret and those types of things that go with a, a suicide loss. And I've been doing a workshop for quite a few years that has been a very popular workshop on, on healing guilt and regret. And, you know, when we start talking about shame, this is what I've noticed. Uh, obviously, my loss, my daughter died in an automobile accident. So I cannot pretend to know from my own experience uh, some of these things that we're talking about here. But the people in my workshops where there's a suicide loss, oftentimes, um, you know, they, they have this shame, and especially early on, that, yeah, they failed. So not only are it's kind of a double-edged sword, I feel like, and maybe you could give some hope or some advice to people that are feeling it this way. Not yeah. only is it, do they feel like maybe the rest of the world world is looking at them and saying, oh my gosh, your child died by suicide. What kind of a parent were you? Why yeah. couldn't you have seen the signs? Why couldn't you have helped? But they're also judging themselves that way. And I noticed that really yeah. is difficult because there's two things going on. There's the grief. They're grieving just the fact that their child or their grandchild or their brother or sister died. But then in addition to that, they're dealing with this complication of you know, should I have seen something? And so they're yeah. getting it both ways. They're getting it from them, themselves. And what would you say to people as maybe a starting point, Franklin, where they could uh, face this, you know, how do they really feel? Do they feel yeah. responsible? How can they work through these types of issues? Well, we're, we're, we're talking about, you know, shame and guilt together here. And um, they certainly uh, go hand in hand. So I guess, what I, what I would say is that that just like everything else about suicide and about grief, each person's experience is different. And I think it's helpful for people really to search through these things and to tell their story about what they think happened and why it happened and talk to others who have had similar experiences. Because I think that once you get this into context, I think it's okay to ask yourself, was my loved one's uh, death preventable? Is there something about what I did or didn't do that may have contributed to my loved one's death, et cetera, et cetera? But I really think to give yourself a fair trial, so to speak, you have to understand that, boy, another person's life is way out of your control and that in the end, really, almost everyone just has done what they can do. Everything they can do has done what they knew to do the best they could do it. And we didn't always know that it was a life or death situation, that if we erred in one way or another, that it might re result in somebody's uh, death. It's scary to know the truth, which is that we have so little control and we don't have control over yes. other people. And I think that scares people. And I think one of the major reasons it scares people is because we're terrified it's going to happen again. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's true. And I, I think that, that another thing about uh, this issue around guilt is that we don't understand the power of the mental illness the person was experiencing 
or the power of the emotional pain the person was experiencing or the power of feeling trapped or hopeless that the person was experiencing. So in a way, we give ourselves or, or, or assign ourselves sort of superhuman powers that we could have, come and o- could have overcome these things on their behalf when in fact our loved ones were overwhelmed by things that truly did turn out to be fatal beyond anything we could have said or done about it. Patty wants to know, at what age is it best to tell a child that her mommy died from suicide when she lost her mommy when she was only one and a half years old? Um, Best age to tell them. Have you got any thoughts, Heidi? My Uncle Keith died. How to tell a child in age-appropriate ways about not only suicide loss, but also about depression and about what do we, we all get to go, go through times where we get depressed. What do we do? Who can we call? Who do we talk to? How do we get help? And it's, it's written for a child. It's really good. Uh, there is something called reversibility and a kid doesn't realize till they're seven that uh, if somebody goes away, they're not, you know, people go and come. They think if they're um, under seven, they don't have this. But the only reason I'm saying that is I think Heidi's right. You're good to go to some books and look and do a little research on it because the way kids respond is going to change depending on their age. Also, you might want to let your, the child's questions guide you. When ch- right. children will ask certain questions at certain ages, and you know, depending on developmentally where the child is, they might eventually come to you and say, "How did mommy die?" You know. Yeah, they might. Ask if you we again. wait for the questions, we kind of know. Okay, they're ready to hear. They want to hear what's going on. I think of the many things that set suicide apart from other types of death. The preoccupation with wondering why this happened and not just necessarily why this this uh, this happened to my loved one but how my loved one could have done this that um, brings up very 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 troubling questions about the meaning of life about whether I really knew the person or not and sometimes the answer to the question why is completely um, elusive and we never do uh, come to a full answer so so a part of the journey for some people is to figure out how to accept whatever you know mystery or, or unanswered questions that are, are in it. And also, this does have to do with each of us having our own story about what happened. And I just encourage people to value their own story, however complete or incomplete it might be, and to um, take, uh, take solace in the idea that really, over time, you're going to know more. You're going to uh, you're going to change yourself. Your p- perspective on what has happened is going to change as well, and that that story is going to continue to unfold for you and have value and meaning for you in your life. And I think that can be the hardest thing, Franklin, because sometimes people don't have notes and they don't have answers, and they never will. And to finally yeah. come to a place where you're like, okay, you know what? I don't know. I don't know. And I think the other piece that I see a lot with people is the idea of we weren't enough to keep them here. Oh, so people can take I, it personally. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I, Even though I, it's not I, about I, so, us. I absolutely think you're right about that, Heidi. I think in, in my case, uh, one of the things I say is our family knew, did everything we could uh, to keep my dad alive, but mostly what we knew how to do was to love him right? Mm -hmm. We didn't know a lot about mental illness. We didn't know a lot about really what to do. So we just loved him and his illness so overpowered, you know, the ability for our simply just our love to keep him alive. And that's very, very disappointing, you know, but it's just one of the things, just like your love can't prevent a heart attack, you know, um, your love sometimes cannot prevent suicide. Uh Absolutely. If, if love could, could prevent it, everybody would still be here. That's correct. So. <laughs> That's absolutely correct. Yeah. Uh, we have some more questions. One of them is uh, on genetics, Franklin. Uh, I don't know. Uh, a woman says that there's a family history, and there are cluster suicides, right? Well, I think the genetic question overall is, is difficult to answer. The way that I... Uh, I think it's best to understand it is that there are diseases that contribute to suicide that have heritable 
elements in them, or, or, or they can be inherited, like schizophrenia, depression, uh, substance abuse. There are some other things that uh, cause suicide that are inheritable. I think, the, I think the main thing to understand is not so much about genetics, but about the fact that what we know now is that people who lose a loved one at su to suicide are, as a population, at a higher risk for suicide because of how, how strenuous it is or how complicated the grief can be. So I just think that to know as a population that we are at a higher risk is important so that we can be extra sensitive to, to that. But I don't, think, um, I don't think we should be unduly alarmed um, by that about our individual situations because that's a population, a statement about us as a population that we're at higher risk. It doesn't really say anything about any particular individual. Uh, the one lady, uh, I want to say to her, I feel so badly, uh, her daughter just uh, died by suicide three oh weeks Oh my. Ago. Yeah, and uh, yeah. oh my goodness, what would you say to her? Oh, I would just say, uh, please, um, I'm so glad that you came here and I hope that you find uh, places where there are other people who have lost a loved one to suicide and find that you're not alone. Uh, three weeks is so recent and it's so raw that I just want you to take the best care of yourself possible and if there is help that you need or if you need someone to talk to, please please reach out to someone that you trust and, and just go ahead and unburden yourself uh, in a safe place where where you can really be listened to and um, I don't know I, I just I just wish I could put my arms around you and just really um, tell you that everything is going to be okay in the long run but I know that that doesn't assuage the the pain you know that you're in today so take it moment by moment and um, do whatever you can uh, to hold on to uh, to the memories of, of your cherished loved one because uh, he, his or her death is not about, it's your daughter, I believe, uh, yeah. uh, Gloria Fortune said. It, it, it's not about uh, just what happened to them in the final moments of her life, but it's about her whole life, you know, and so remember um, what, what, a, what a lovely person she was to you as well. So. It's so difficult to speak out into the emptiness, kind of, but know that, that you're out there um, um, suffering uh, from your loss. And I just want you to feel um, that you are not alone. We're very uh, aware of the Compassionate Friends that the, the suicide loss has its unique complications and that it is so important that if you have that loss, you're able to connect with others. And I would encourage this person also to go to our Facebook page, our TCF uh, USA Facebook page. We have a closed Facebook page that you can find access to. And closed means that the only people who post in there and can read those posts have actually had a child, a grandchild, or a sibling die by suicide. And you've got people in there that are far down the road. There's hundreds of people who post in there. There's a lot of encouraging things, but for somebody who's new, that would be a great place to start. Absolutely. You can also get information on this at our website, uh, compassionatefriends.org. And I also know that at Open to Hope, you guys have a lot of resources that are available to this woman as well. But I would highly encourage you to get into our closed Facebook page, where you can get uh, people and read things 24-7 and to get into Open to Hope and look at some of the wonderful articles and and TV and radio programs to help you find additional support. So I just want to make sure we put that Absolutely. out there. Absolutely. And we have somebody here who also just uh, threw in, if anybody listening is feeling, having suicidal feelings, that he's gotten involved with, uh, as a community educator with SAVE, capital S-A-V-E, uh, Suicide Awareness Voices of Education. He said that might be a good site, you know, for you to go to. Um, mm -hmm. Franklin, there also, uh, is somebody who just came on and they must have twins three months ago the brother uh, died by suicide they have two daughters 13 and who are 13 then they're now 16 and and the parents feel uh, irresponsible they know they're sitting that there's guilt and they need to start the process of healing do you have any suggestions of what this person could do uh, for the kids 
I have to say to start with, three years is not a long time. The world thinks three years is a long time. It's not a long time after yeah. you have a loss. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think that uh, these parents are, are expressing something that I've heard many, many times, uh, especially about teenage children. Parents very often worry geez, I don't know if my, if my teenage children are, are okay with this, or I don't know if my teenage children are, are, are working through their grief, and so on and so forth. And so I think that, uh, I think a couple of things uh, might be helpful. You know, one is that you, to, to give your children the latitude uh, to, to do this in their own way and on their own timetable, but also to make yourself very available uh, to your children and open to talk about um, this loss in a very frank way yourself. I think also to see if there are peers uh, of theirs who, or if you can find peers, uh, people their age who have had lost experiences or are in grief groups, to see if that's something uh, that your children uh, might might benefit from. I I think that also um, I sometimes like to say do it yourself and teach the world how are you doing, how's their father doing, you know, how's the family, yeah. how is no, the that's family. That's a great doing? point. After three years, that as I said, it's a short time. Uh, you know, I my son did not die by suicide. He and his cousin died in an automobile accident. I, to, I was not in good shape after three years. I was still struggling. I was getting better. Things were getting better. I was, but I was still struggling. Yeah, I think the other thing that might be helpful is just to realize that we go in a spiral over our grief, and so as we grow older and older, at each developmental phase we go through there's an opportunity re to revisit this. So in a way, I would just say, don't feel too uh, pressured by being on a deadline for people, quote, to deal with it. But just stay open to the idea that it's a lifelong journey and that your support is going to be there when they need it. Somebody else uh, asked a question, what does it mean everything will be all right in the long run? What does that look like? <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, that's a great question. What does it mean everything will be all right in, in the long run? Because in a way, it's kind of a cliche, isn't it? Uh, just to say that everything will be okay in the long run. I, I think that uh, what, what I believe is that there is great hope um, for survivors of suicide loss and that even though it can be horrible and, and terribly difficult and painful, not only in the first weeks or months, but, but for a long period of time, off and on, that pain can be very, very uh, difficult to deal with. When I say everything's going to be all right in the long run, what I mean is that we really can get through this each in our own way. And so being all right, what we call a new normal, is up to each of us. I don't have a preconceived notion about what that means, but that even... I don't think that time heals, but I do think that it takes time to heal. So I believe that if people uh, will, will continue to show up and will continue to be hopeful and will continue to do the next thing that they know to do in their life to, to navigate their world, that over time, all right, we do heal from our grief, even from the worst grief. And that doesn't mean that we quit missing our loved ones. That doesn't mean that we quit feeling pain over the loss. But that over time, with the right kind of support, that we really do heal or recover from our grief. So that's really what I, what I mean by that. And I, I really am very, very serious about wanting people each to, to have their own definition of what it means to, quote, be all right or, quote, to be healed because I don't want to put my ideas about that on, on anybody. Each person but, but Franklin, is on their I, own journey. Franklin, I think this is a very, very important and key comment coming from you. You devote your life to helping people find hope after suicide loss. You know thousands and thousands of people who have had this shared this similar journey. And you know, you also understand on a deep level, professionally and personally, that initially when we have a loved one that dies by suicide, we think that our lives are over 
yeah. destroyed and that we're going to die of a broken heart and that there's no way in hell there's hope. And you're here to say, yes. look, I know it might not seem like it right now, but please lean on Franklin's hope until you find your own. Absolutely. It no, is I, out there. And the first step is getting on this webinar and, and like Alan said, getting into groups and reaching out. You don't need to do it alone. I mean, this is such a horrible, hard thing to deal with initially. That's that's very that's very well said, uh, Heidi. Uh, when you are in the midst of that awful pain, it does seem like you cannot survive it. And so people like me and others who have gone through it um, are here as a testimony that, yes, we have experienced that. Yes, we have felt the same way, and there really is hope for you. I like to tell people, listen, the death of a loved one really does break your heart. And if you can learn how to cope and learn how to go on day by day through it in a healthy way, that the broken heart will also be broken open to your new life, whatever that might be, you know. So I just really think that uh, that there's hope for each and every one of us. And I've just seen people come from the worst, worst circumstances and from the most painful uh, painful experiences and, and to have recovered, you know, and there's nothing magic about it. So that's not what I'm trying to say, but, um, but there is great hope for everyone. Can I, can I personalize this a little bit with you, Franklin? Cause I know sure. you, you, you did end up in some uh, drug and alcohol kinds of things after your dad. So you haven't had a straight road. I mean, you are really no. telling people it's a tough road, but no, uh, it's it true. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't mind, I don't mind talking about my own, my own journey in that way. For me, I, and it's one of the reasons why I think I, I feel so strongly about trying to uh, share a hopeful message with other people is that really for a dozen years, a dozen years after my uh, father died, I continued, uh, I was an addict before he died, so I'm not saying that that caused it, but there were, a dozen very, very dark years um, after my father died that included, um, you know, everything that happens to a person who has a problem, problems with addiction. And, you know, I, re I, re I recovered from all of that. Um, and it was through the help of, of peer supporters in, in, in uh, addiction recovery and then later help from peer supporters who had lost a loved one to suicide. So I'm a, I'm a great believer in the idea that those of us who have had a loss, if we share with one another, that we can help each other with this. I've seen it happen. I know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of survivors. I've, I've met with survivors um, in the minutes and the hours after uh, they've lost a loved one to suicide. And I've seen people at every stage of this, of this, uh, of this really horrible Loss and and we really do uh, have if we can find the right support and if we can keep walking through it, um, we really do have great hope to recover from from uh, the darkness of it. Truly. Oh, thank you for that. I, there's another question here, and I think um, says, can you speak to how suicide affects a husband and a wife? We are ten months out. Things oh are not looking good in our situation. Yeah. You know, let me say one one thing quickly because my husband and I are still together after the death of our son after many years. There is a rumor out there, and Alan can talk about research that Compassionate Friends has done, that says if you've had the death of a child, there's a high, high divorce rate. That has never been proven. That has never been shown. And I know Compassionate yeah. Friends did a study, right, Alan? Yeah, I mean, what we've found, and while it wasn't a clinical study, it was more done in a survey form, we found that the divorce rate with families who uh, marriages have had a child die is about the same. We found that if there were fractures in the, the marriage before, uh, those fractures can definitely break it apart. But many people uh, will tell us that, that actually the loss of their child brought them uh, closer together. And so, you know, I think. My, my thoughts on this, and had, oh, and it hasn't even been a year. Yeah. Well, there's so many things there with how we're going to grieve differently, as we all know on this call. Each of them, husband and wife, is going to grieve so uniquely. Their perspective on the suicide, I'm sure, 
is is different. Can you talk a little bit about that, Franklin? That they're going to yeah, sure. Well, y yes. First of all, I'm just so sorry um, to hear about oh. this couple's loss, and you know, ten months is like like yesterday. And so, I just want to first of all um, uh, agree with something Alan said about each of us grieving in very different ways, and it can be an extraordinary challenge for a couple to grieve uh, the loss of a child especially if they have quite different grieving styles. And again, I don't know anything about this particular couple, but sometimes, you know, sometimes, for instance, uh, the man in a couple will seem more stoic or, you know, will, will rely on things like going back to work or, or activities uh, to grieve, and the wife will be more emotional or more emotive or need to talk about the child or, or things like that. And the point is not what the particulars are in each person's circumstance, but that they don't line up with each other and that there's misunderstanding between the two people of what the other person's behavior means. In other words, the, we start to miscommunicate and misinterpret that because you're handling it this way, it means you don't miss our son as much or or you don't you want to forget or or that you're not supporting me, et cetera, et cetera. And and when two people are going through this together, they are also very much both vulnerable or or we in a weakened state, let's say, in terms of their own struggles with grief. So at the time they need each other the most, they might be least able to provide extra support for the other one because they're both just treading water as hard as they can. So all these complications are in the mix. I'm also, I just also want to say that, you know, discovering the, the body of, of, of your child, you know, there might be some complicated grief. Extra help. I think if you're already saying, look, I feel some alarm bells going off. I think that's what the, the question said. Well, if those are going off, then maybe, maybe some professional help even might be in order and you could explore, explore that because certainly um, this has been a terrible, terrible tragedy, and um, if you could get some extra help, maybe it would help you through it. I think, uh, I believe that almost everyone that has a, a family member die has some of these qualities early on. Yeah. Of this syndrome. But I'm concerned that this uh, mom who witnessed it, yeah. uh, you know, let's just run through some of these. I think sure. we'll all identify with them. Sure. Well, let's, yeah, let me just set this slide up a little bit by saying that, um, that, that one of the things about suicide, as with many other types of death, is that, that it's violent or, or that it traumatizes the person who is left behind. And so certainly we are all affected by that, but some percentage of people who are exposed to, um, to a traumatic event may actually develop a sort of a malady or something that truly is a mental health uh, issue called uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, and these are the symptoms. And so I would just say that you know, if you are if you are if it's been more than a few months since your loved one died, and you are experiencing the, these symptoms in an ongoing way, then that is definitely uh, a reason to go and seek help for somebody who deals with PTSD. The good news is that there are. Uh, there are there are pretty good treatments for PTSD if you find the right uh, you know a caregiver who can who can deliver those and it's just something that's part of that comes with the territory that we are traumatized by this whether or not we develop a disorder over it or not we are generally uh, traumatized by a death by suicide because it is it is a it, it is either a directly violent death one that that we witness or or, or that we come upon the scene. Uh, it might be that we are traumatized by uh, the suffering that led up to it, our loved one's uh, life being hard and painful and, and just, you know, no answers to very hard questions in their life. And uh, we might also be traumatized by what I call virtual trauma, which is whether we uh, witness the scene or not, we get in our mind the need to go through what our loved one went through in the in the final hours or minutes of their lives, and we start to replay that in a way that is not good for us. There are some great ways to deal with it. Uh, Honey, you wanted to talk about a couple of ways to deal with it: post-traumatic stress, yes, EMDR, which is you know you guys know about this, but uh, it's and you know you go and see a therapist, and you know 
they have a wand that you follow and you don't you don't lose the memories but you lose all the emotion and pain that and the trauma that goes along with some of those memories and I worked with you know firefighters for 10 years after 9-11 and they were re-traumatized because they were down at the site constantly and it was very traumatic and they a few of them went to EMDR and they said it changed their lives so it's a very powerful method of treatment. So this is uh, this is how you can contact follow up question uh, Franklin at personalgriefcoach.com and if you want to know about my coaching services there's my website. I also uh, uh, forgot to put on this slide um, an online resource for survivors of suicide loss and those who care for them. And I can say that really, uh, it's, it's, it's called a bit link. There's a, an abbreviated link and it's bit.ly 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 forward slash. And then just one word after a suicide bit.ly forward slash after a suicide. And that's an online uh, resource directory for uh, resources for survivors of suicide loss and those who care for them. And I would welcome people to uh, take a look at that at that website as well. And if I can be of any help to you um, or answer follow-up questions, you, you're, you're welcome to email me at franklin at personalgriefcoach.com. I think one of the things that we've learned tonight is when you're grieving a loss to suicide, that the two elements that we really preach uh, to people is one is educate yourself. Um, educate yourself about suicide loss, about what to expect, what the journey is like, and, and certainly listening to this webinar and watching it tonight is a step in that direction. But also find support, whatever that means to you. People Absolutely. often ask us, Gloria and Heidi and myself, and I'm sure you, they want it a quick answer to how do we get to where it's going to be all right, as you say. And two of the key components that we just keep reiterating are educate yourself about, in this case, suicide and the loss, and then find support, whether that's on the phone with Franklin as a personal grief coach, whether that's in a closed Facebook page or in uh, talking to people, or whether it's in a support group. Get people around you who are newer than you in the loss and farther down the road than you in the loss. And that's where you will find hope. You will see people who are living again, who are laughing again, who have found life again. And great purpose and great meaning and even transformation, the, this grief can be transformational. So thank you for validating that for all of us. Thank you all. I just want people to know that you know, you have a right to grieve in your own way. And if you would just follow uh, Alan's uh, admonition there to get as much help as you can get. You deserve uh, nothing but uh, nothing but uh, great comfort um, after the loss that you've suffered, and I wish everyone only the best. Thank you, Franklin, and thank you for all you're doing. I know that your father is looking down very proud of you. You are really, really changing the world. 